My name is Erin, and I'm so glad that you've decided to worship with us here at Living Hope Christian Church this morning. We're delighted to once again be joining in worship three different ways, here online, as well as at Drive-In Church on campus, and also under the tent on campus.
In just a moment, we'll kick off the service with a time in worship. Following that, we will have a few important announcements and then join Pastor Eric as we dive into God's word for our message today. Let's join together in worship and celebration this morning. We thank you, Father, that we can trust in you and that you are moving and working, God, even when we don't even know that you are. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. Yes, God. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm going to see in the middle of a storm. against us shall prosper and all those who rise up against us shall fall
Father, you are forever glorified. There is none like you, our mighty and risen Savior. We just glorify your name.
Abba, Father, we just praise your name. Daddy, we love you this morning and all that you've done for us. Father. 
Hi again, Erin here. Just a few quick announcements before we head into God's Word this morning. Please be sure to visit our website, www.livinghopechurch.info, for all the ways you can stay connected with us. If you've worshipped here with us this morning, we want to know that you joined us. Please be sure to fill out a virtual connection card that you can find on our website. Whether you worshipped with us here online, under the tent, or in your car, especially if you're a visitor, we want to be able to reach out to you. Please fill out that virtual connection card. While you're on our website, you can also find access to things like our children's ministry links, our discipleship Bible study, and our Wednesday devotional. Also on our website, you'll find ways to give online. Simply click on the giving tab and you'll find access and step-by-step -step directions. If you'd rather mail your tithes and offerings into us here at the church, you'll also find our street address on the website. We'd also like you to mark your calendars because on June 20th at 8 a.m., that's a Saturday, we're gonna be having another work day to clear out the rest of the backfield. We had a generous donor who has provided the means for us to get the field hydro seeded. And so we wanna be able to prepare the field to get that done. If you're interested in joining us that Saturday morning at eight o'clock or any amount of time that you can give to us that day, please head over to our website and click on the link to sign up so that we know that you're on your way to us. One more quick important announcement before we head into God's word with Pastor Eric. This summer, we're taking kids on a ride they will never forget. Get on board the Rocky Railway. We'll be on track to learn about all the ways we can trust Jesus. We'll have locomotion games, Bible adventures, amazing discoveries at Imagination Station, and exciting songs to get you moving right along. The best part of summer is full steam ahead at Rocky Railway Virtual BBS, where Jesus' power pulls us through. Be sure to register now. Good morning, Living Hope. It's great to be with you today, even if it's just over a screen. We're so excited about uh, looking forward to July the 5th when we'll be in our building and uh, worshiping together. That's coming up. We also have something else I want you to be aware of is we've got a work day in a week on Saturday the 20th um, at 8 a.m. We are getting ready to plant some more grass and we're all excited about it, but we've still got a bunch of rocks there. And so if you've got a rake um, and can come out and help us get rid of some of those rocks, uh, it'll be a blessing for generations afterwards who will use that field. We've been looking at 12 transformational words, and today's word is generosity. And that's something I hope to be known as. As, a, as people think of me, they say, he was a generous person. Um, so let's look at Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 to 3, and this is God's inerrant, infallible, and all-sufficient word. Now listen very carefully. These are so important, these words. This is God speaking to Abraham. He's called him out of Ur and the Chaldeans, and he's come now to the promised land, and he's giving Abraham, this great promise, which I'm going to apply to you. And uh, here it begins in verse 2. Here's the word of God. I will make you, Abraham, into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous. And why is that? Look at this next part. Very important. And you will be a blessing to others. I really want that part to grab you. You're being blessed so that you can be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. Wow, did you catch that? All, that's a very big word. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. It's my prayer that through the blessings God gives you, that you will bless the nations of the earth. Yes, locally here, but also internationally as well. 
And then look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11. Paul is speaking to the Corinthians and saying, Yes, verse 11, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. Do you get that? You will be enriched. You're the one that's going to be enriched. Why? So that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. Why? Because God's given them a wonderful blessing working through the Corinthians. This is the word of God. There was a movie, a private movie that came out about five years ago called The Dropbox. And it's the story of this Pastor Lee in Seoul, Korea, who is saving all these children, hundreds and hundreds of children every year in Seoul, Korea, are given up, uh, mostly because they have deformities or something uh, they feel is wrong, disabilities, and so they're just abandoned. And this Pastor Lee built a special box he called the drop box that's heated, that has a little buzzer that tells people inside when a baby's been put there, if somebody wants to give up their baby, they go and place it in this drop box, and then Pastor Lee helps it get adopted or else he cares for it himself. Well, this young man by the name of Brian Ivey saw this story in the Los Angeles Times. He was a student at uh, Uni University of Southern California, USC, in the filmmaking program. And it just hit him. He wasn't even a Christian yet. It just hit him as he read this story about this pastor who has now saved 600 babies. He said, if I don't tell his story, then it'll be forgotten that this man has done such a wonderful thing. So he makes an arrangement uh, with Pastor Lee and asks for permission to come out to Seoul and to film what he's doing. He raised $65,000 very easily, and he was amazed at all these Christians that gave to it. And uh, he found 11 students that would help him. He spent three months there making the movie and then um, uh, came back and distributed the movie, and he had made this commitment. I am going to take a portion of the proceeds, and I'm going to give it back to Pastor Lee. Now, in the process of three months of filming, three months of sleeping on the floor in the orphanage, he was so overwhelmed by the love of Jesus in Pastor Lee that he gave his own heart to Christ. But he takes this movie and says, I'm going to give the proceeds, a portion of that, to Pastor Lee. He was able to give $1.4 million to Pastor Lee. And you say, well, well, what about him? He did all of this work. He got, and I can't remember exactly how many it was, but something like 10 million hits on the internet for people that watched that movie on the internet and he shot into his name was suddenly very valuable and everybody wanted him for directing their movies. So he got blessed even though his plan was to bless Pastor Lee. And there he is. Doesn't he look like a young uh, fellow there uh, doing that? But here's the principle. He wanted to bless Pastor Lee, God blessed him, and then he used that blessing to bless someone else. If you have your outline, the first thing I'd like you to look at is point number one. There are four points that I want to get across to you, and they're so important, so please hang in there for the entirety of this video and, and live streaming. And listen carefully to these points. Number one, as God blessed Abraham, so he wants to bless you. God is looking to bless you the same way. The Greek word for blessing is makarios, and it means to make large. And so 
when it says in the prayer of Jabez in 1 Chronicles uh, chapter 4, verse 10, Oh, that the Lord would bless me and enlarge my territory. Those two words are tied together, both enlarge. I want to bless you so you can enlarge the territory that you have. That's the idea of making large and blessing. Uh, God talks to Jerusalem in Isaiah chapter 54 saying, Enlarge the place of your tent, Jerusalem. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. All those ideas of being larger tie in with the word blessing. God wants to make you large so that you can give to others. He wants to expand what you have, not so that you can have more toys, but so that you can give to others. Just as much as he wanted to bless Abraham, he wants to bless you, and he wants you to touch all sorts of families. God blessed Pastor Lee, not so that he could have more stuff, but so that he could reach more orphans, touch more lives. As you look from the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation in every book of the Bible, you will see that God wants to bless people. And he's looking to bless you the same way he has for people all over the century. It's kind of summed up in the words Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, verse 9, when he says, Which of you, if your son asked for bread, would you give him a stone? Of course you wouldn't give him a stone. You'd give him bread. They're looking for bread. You're not going to be mean to him. And you're a human. How much more does God want to give? Or if he asked for a fish, will you give him a snake? No, you wouldn't even think of such a thing. You want to give good things to your kids. You love your kids. You care for them. God cares for you. And he wants to give you good things, but he also wants to use it for you to use it as a double blessing. And there's a book I used extensively in preparation for this called Double Blessing by Mark Batterson, who's one of my favorite authors. And in this, he just goes on and on about this point of the double blessing. God wants to bless you so that you can bless others. And that's what I want to encourage you to think. Now, this isn't the health and wealth gospel, that everything's going to be rosy, God's just going to give you a bunch of money. There is point number two, a brutal battle before the blessing. Not every time, but an awful lot of the times. And when I say a brutal battle, I mean brutal. I don't mean, oh, it's a little minor thing, a little hiccup along the road. I mean you are attacked in every way to the very core of your being. Here is uh, uh, Jacob in Genesis chapter 32, verse 26 on your outline A. And Jacob is coming home, and Jacob has been a deceiver. That's what his name means. And he cheated his brother out of a blessing from the father, and then he took off, and he's been gone for 20 years. He's coming home, and he knows his brother Esau is very strong, very powerful, has an army around him, and that Esau hasn't forgotten what happened 20 years earlier. So he sends some presents ahead, but he knows a few little presents won't make up for all that he did wrong. And so that night he is sleeping, and it says there in uh, the scriptures, Isaiah, or excuse me, uh, Genesis 36, then the man said, and we know who this man is that's wrestling all night with him, he is Jesus. He is God, it says. So he's the second member, uh, member of the Trinity called a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. So here he says, the man said, let me go. All night long, Jacob has been wrestling with this man for a blessing, to get God's blessing. Let me go for it's daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you 
bless me. Now God is going to reward Jacob for his tenacity, but he's wrestling. Have you ever done wrestling before? It's exhausting to wrestle with someone. And here he is all night long wrestling with God for a blessing. And God likes it. When you persevere, when you persist and don't give up at the first struggle, the first problem, God takes great pleasure in that. And so God allows there to be a struggle and to be a battle many times before he gives the blessing. But here's what happened. He wrestled, and the man said, um, he said, I won't let you go until you bless me. And the, guy, the man gives the blessing to Jacob. Here's another story that uh, Jesus tells in Luke chapter 18. Here is this widow. She's been struggling with injustice. And she goes to a judge. And the judge says, I don't care about God. I don't care about people. I'm not giving her anything. Well, it says in verse 3, a widow of that city came to him repeatedly. That means day in, day out, she keeps coming again and again and again, saying, give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. And the judge ignored her for a while. And it's going to go on to say in the rest of the passage, he goes, even though I don't care about God, even though I don't care about man, this woman is wearing me out, and therefore I'm going to give her justice. And Jesus said, pray that way. Pray persistently. Don't give up. Keep persisting in prayer and see if the blessing doesn't come. And again, as I said over and over again in the Bible and in history, we see people who've had a horrible beginning, a horrible battle where Satan is doing everything he can to crush them and stop them. They persist, and then God gives the great blessing. I want to tell you the story of a person who said, I am now the most miserable man living. Who in the world would that be, saying he's the most miserable man? Look at what else he said. If what I feel were more equally distributed to the whole human family, there would not be one cheerful person on the face of the earth. That is somebody down in the dumps. When they're saying, if it was distributed to everyone, not one person would be cheerful. That's somebody struggling horribly with depression. This young man, when he was nine years old, uh, lost his mother. He already lived in abject poverty, just complete poverty. And then his mother, who he loved, died when he's only nine years old. He's got a sister 12 years old. Father is so uh, wiped out by the death of his wife that he deserts the two of them for seven months. Then he comes back uh, with a new stepmom for this young man, and... Uh, she said when she met them, they were living like animals. Well, I bet if you've been deserted for seven months and you're a little kid. The young man grew up, wanted to study, wanted to learn, but his dad felt education was a waste of time and it was taking you away from doing manual labor that needed to be done. And so any time this young man was caught studying, he would be whipped and his book would be thrown away. And finally, he left home and set out on his own and had business failure after business failure. His very first love died on him. And that's why he said he was oh, so miserable. This young man, as some of you may have guessed, was Abraham Lincoln. And we wonder how this, one of the most beloved if not the most beloved of all the presidents, how in the world could he have handled that pressure of the Civil War where 500,000 soldiers were killed? Was it because of what he went through that he was able to guide our nation through that very, very difficult and destructive period of life? Before the blessing, 
so often there is a brutal battle to go through. Rick Warren has been powerfully used. He has more baptisms per uh, year than any other church in the United States. And yet, his very first year of ministry, he felt he couldn't take it. He had to be hospitalized for depression because it was so hard for him. But he persisted and hung in there, and God blessed him mightily. Maybe you haven't heard of uh, one of the greatest preachers of the 1800s, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. But at age 19, he was given the largest church in England. By the time he's done, he had the largest church in the world. He preached up to 10 times a week. I can't even imagine that. He wrote 150 books. He started a college that he oversaw. He started an orphanage that he oversaw. He was the editor of a magazine. He had 66 different charities that he was overseeing. And yet, he said, before every new venture that would be wonderfully blessed, before each one, he would have a terrible period of depression. And he didn't want success. He said what he'd like to do, if he could do anything, was immigrate to the United States and go find a place in the woods that he could make a nest and then just hide out in that nest. He didn't want to be around people, but God blessed him over and over. But boy, what a battle he went through in each case. The great C.S. Lewis, Professor Lewis, said, the cross comes before the crown. And tomorrow is a Monday morning. Always there's the cross, then the crown. There's a battle, then the blessing that God wants to give to any one of you. Here's what James says in James chapter 1, verse 2, and we went over this a couple weeks ago when we were talking about growth. When troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. God allows these trials. Satan means them for evil. But God allows them because they strengthen you and prepare you for the blessing that God is going to give you but you're not ready for until you go through the battle. And the battle does things inside of you that prepares you for the blessing. Now here's the purpose, number three on your outline, the purpose of the blessing. As I read earlier for you in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, I will bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. Verse 3, you'll be a blessing to all families. God wants to bless you, not so that you can keep it and go, look what I've got, but so that you can bless others with it. Yes, there's a portion that you keep, but he's giving it to you so that you can bless other people. And our goal as believers is that blessing others becomes a lifestyle, not a once-in-a-lifetime thing or a twice-a-year sort of thing, but this becomes a lifestyle. That every time we're blessed, we take some of that and we give it to someone else. And we say, God, this was a gift from you. This didn't come from me. I'm going to use it to bless others who don't have this and are in need of it. Jesus goes so far as to say, even bless those who treat you badly, those who are rough and harsh and tough on you and mean to you. Here's what Jesus said again in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. But I say, love your enemies. Your enemy, by definition, is not your friend. And yet he's saying, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you'll be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. 
If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. So he's saying, love even your enemies. Give even to your enemies and bless them. Jesus uh, uh, tells the story of the rich young ruler that came to him, and it's recorded in Luke and recorded in Matthew. Here comes this rich young ruler. He's very wealthy. He's very young. And he says, how do I get into heaven? And Jesus points out some of the uh, Ten Commandments and talks to the guy, kind of setting him up. And the guy says, I kept all of these commandments. And then he says, what do I lack? If he's doing all the commandments, he's got riches, he's got a power of, uh, a position of power, what, what, why, what do you mean, what do I lack? I think he felt something was missing. Because when you step out in faith and give to the Lord, there is an excitement that goes through the veins of your body that absolutely are thrilling as you wait to see how is God going to come through for us in this situation. So that's what he was lacking. And so Jesus said to him, give up everything. Sell everything you have and come and follow me. And he walked away sad, it says. He was sad. He wasn't happy. As he's walking away, he's not having that exhilarating feeling of giving it all to the Lord. And what he missed was an incredible opportunity that he didn't even recognize. First of all, right after that, Jesus said, when you give up houses, when you give up things for me, when you give up people and everything for me, I'll bless you many times over in this life and in the life to come. But here's something much more important than that. The rich young ruler missed the opportunity to be one of Jesus' disciples, to follow him for three and a half years and to eat with Jesus, observe the miracles taking place, to watch his interaction with people, to get the debriefing afterwards. That was irreplaceable. And sometimes we miss tremendous opportunities when we don't give that special portion that God said, take this and give it to someone else. When we're on our deathbed, I don't think our biggest re regrets will be, well, I made this mistake and I shouldn't have done that. I think our biggest regret will be the opportunities we missed to step out in faith and to watch God do supernatural things. And that's what I want for each one of you. As you are blessed each time, give to others. And watch what God does with that blessing. Now you say, how much should I give? Well, I hope you set goals uh, just like you do in other areas of your life. And there are two questions I'd like to ask you. But first, let me read 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7. He says, since you excel in many ways, and each and every one of you have excelled in amazing ways, in all sorts, just numerous, numerous ways. And he's saying, since you excel in many ways in your faith, so many of you excel in your faith, your gifted speakers, so many of you are great speakers, your knowledge, so many of you are absolutely brilliant, in your enthusiasm that I'm so grateful for, in your love for others, so many of you are just overflowing with love and giving, and you excel in giving love. He said, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. And that's what I want to encourage you is to excel in giving. Well, how can I excel in giving? Well, here's two questions I want you to ask before you give 
out of what God has already given. Remember, it's always God's. It's not really a sacrifice because you're going to get it back, whether it's in this life or eternity, you're going to get it back. So it's not too great a sacrifice. Here's what I'd like you to ask. Number one is A on your outline. Does this goal require faith? The amount I'm giving, does it require faith? If it doesn't require faith, it's not a very sacrificial gift. The second question I want you to ask is, does this goal, and my goal is to excel in giving, does this goal stretch me? If this isn't something that really stretches you, ask God. I think he'll tell you that he would like it to be bigger. I want to encourage you to give generously to the Lord. Let me tell you something about a great, perhaps one of the greatest composers ever, John Frederick, or George Frederick Handel, and he wrote the piece that's so familiar to us, the Messiah that you always hear at Christmas time. Well, well um, Handel was a prolific composer. He wrote 42 operas. Can you imagine that many operas? 29 uh, oratorios, 120 cantatas. Uh, Beethoven, who was also a genius and an incredible composer, said, to handle, I bow my knee. But when Handel hit age 56, it looked like he was washed up. It looked like he was done for. Um, he didn't seem to be able to compose. He was depressed. He was in debt. His creditors were saying that they were going to uh, put him in jail because he owed them money. And to make things even worse, he had a stroke and had trouble using his right hand. How in the world is he going to compose music? He's right-handed, and now he can't use his right hand. How is he going to do that? But he made a deal with the Lord. He said, Lord, I want to write one more great piece of music. And it seemed like, you know, he's on his last legs. He's about to, to die here. And Lord, I'm going to take the proceeds of this last piece, and I'm going to give it to the debtor's prison to free men who are there so that because they couldn't pay their bills, you'd go to debtor's prison until those bills were paid. He said, I want to pay for that. And so he made that deal with the Lord. He wanted to be blessed so that he could bless others. Well, guess what happened? When you make a deal like that with the Lord to say, I want to use what you give me to bless others, it's like the whole room comes alive with the Holy Spirit. He sat down, and uh, on August, what was it, 22nd, I've got it there, 1741, he sat down, and for 21 days, he barely ate anything, he barely slept, he worked and worked and worked, and he felt like supernaturally, this piece of music was coming together and he watched what God did and as he got to the last part the hallelujah chorus he said I did think that I did see all heaven before me and the great God himself do you see what happened he's in this room for 21 days and God is there with him because he's promising that he's going to give to other people what God blesses him with. He finally left that room after 21 days and had a 259-page uh, uh, masterpiece that he called the Messiah. 142 men were freed from prison because of that piece of music that he had given. I think, what was it? 86,000 
dollars was what the equivalent was in today's dollars that he raised. And that was just with the first performance. Over and over, some people say this is the most uh, repeated and played piece of music it is. And here's what one of his bi biographers wrote about Handel. Messiah has fed the hungry, clothed the naked, fostered the orphan more than any single musical production. You see, not only did he give that first time, but he gave again and again, and finally he put it in his will that the proceeds were to go to the foundling hospital. And when, we, when they called a hospital, we would call it more like a city mission. It was a place where people were fed, where they could, uh, the homeless could find a place to sleep, where orphans could go for help, widows could go. And so the proceeds of this over and over again, over 250 years, has gone to care for that. Another biographer wrote, perhaps the works of no other composer have so largely contributed to the relief of human suffering. Can you see what happens when you say, Lord, whatever you bless me with, a portion of that I'm going to give so that it becomes a double blessing. Yes, it's a blessing to me, but it's also a blessing to others. See if God doesn't bless you in an overwhelming way if you are willing to do just that. I want to encourage you to test God and see if he doesn't do the same thing that he did for Handel. See if he doesn't do it for you. The same thing he did for Brian Ivey in the Dropbox where he said, I'm going to give this for the sake of these orphans, for these kids that are unwanted. Uh, Pastor Lee called his congregation the most unwanted congregation on the planet because it's made up of these babies that were given up that nobody wanted. I want to see you have the joy of watching what God does when you give a portion of everything you receive to God. See if God doesn't powerfully bless you as well as you do just that. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, we love you so much. And I pray, God, for you to give faith to each person listening to this message. And I pray, God, that they will want to test you. And they will want to give from their abundance that you've blessed them with that they'll want to give to others and test and see if you don't bless them many times over. Thank you for your goodness, God. Thank you for how you've blessed us so many times over and over. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like to talk about this, if you have any questions, there's a connect place on your uh, on the website that you can go to and write questions or contact us. If you'd like us to have your email address so that we can send updates to you, please write your name and your email so that we can send uh, out information and keep you posted as we prepare to go back into the building and so many other exciting things. Thank you so much. Thank you, Father, that you encircle me that your powerful arm protects me from every side. There's a table that you prepared for me In the presence of my enemies It's your body and your blood you shed for me this is how I fight my battles There's a table that you prepared for me In the presence of my enemies It's your body and your blood you shed for me This 